All right, good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Meg Lambert. I've been a nurse for more years than I care to admit. And for the last 10 years, I worked at Barrow Neurological Institute with Dr. Francisco Ponce, who's the neurosurgeon who performs the procedure. Um, most recently, I've migrated over to a position with Medtronic Corporation, which is one of the device manufacturers. But today, I'm just teaching about DBS, just so you know. Uh, later on, the three device makers, the three companies that make the DBS device, will be talking to you specifically about the features and the benefits of each of the products. But today, I'm just going to talk to you about DBS. I'm going to talk about what it is, who is a good candidate for DBS, how we work you up and determine that, the actual surgery itself, and what to expect after surgery. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Oh, a show of hands. How many Parkinson's patients do we have today? Anybody with essential tremor? Anybody with dystonia? Okay. All right. Uh, can somebody help me with the clicker? It was working before. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't get it to move on here either. There we go. Thank you. Yep. All right, what is DBS? DBS is a surgical treatment that helps control some of the symptoms of certain movement disorders. We put little electrical wi oh, little wires in the brain and we apply electrical stimulation to these certain areas called nuclei in the brain that we know house the circuits for nerve impulses that create movement. By putting electrical stimulation in these areas of the brain, we're able to overcome the abnormal signals that you're getting causing your symptoms to make your symptoms less. Uh, DBS is not a cure for your disease, but nor is a treatment of last resort. Many years ago when DBS came out, doctors would say, well, I've tried everything with you. Let's just do this, this brain procedure. Well, that's not what we want these days. We want to capture people in their disease state where we know by applying DBS, we can extend your quality of life for many, many, many years. DBS works in conjunction with medication and therapy. And sometimes it depends. You can reduce your medication or maybe stop your medication altogether. So how does it work? This is a little video I want to show you, just primarily so you can see where the device is implanted in the body. DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker, and thin, soft, flexible wires called leads completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin in the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. Electrical stimulation is then sent directly to targeted areas within the brain. Stimulation of these areas enables the brain circuits that control movement to function better. Okay, I stopped it there because I want you to see exactly where the device is implanted within the body. As you can see, there is a pacemaker in the chest. It's a brain pacemaker, much like a cardiac pacemaker. Then there's a wire that connects it under the skin, all the way up under the skin of the scalp, to those wires in the brain called leads. And you can see the whole system here. This patient has two leads in place. Sometimes we only put in one, depending on the patient. But I just wanted you to see where the device is actually placed in the body. Uh, you won't glow in the dark, I promise you. This results in a reduction of some symptoms in many patients. Okay, I'm going to give you a brief history of deep brain stimulation. Back in the day, the only surgical procedure available to patients with movement disorders was a surgery called a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy, and it was for tremor only. That was it. 
So if people had severe, severe tremor and medication wasn't working and it affected their ability to eat, dress, do anything, whether it was a Parkinson's tremor or a central tremor, the only surgical treatment available, thalamotomy, pallidotomy, where they would have the patient awake, drill a hole, put a wire in, give it a little stimulation, watch to see if the tremor stopped, and then zap, burn the brain tissue. We still do this procedure today. It's still available for patients that can't undergo other procedures or can't tolerate medications. However, it's permanent. That brain tissue doesn't regenerate. And you can only do one side of the brain, and you performed that. So the other side was still untreated. And thirdly, many times patients had strokes. So, but if you had a severe tremor and there was nothing else for you, a lot of people underwent this therapy. So back in France, there was a doctor named Dr. Benabid, a neurosurgeon who did quite a few of these. So in the 80s, 1987 specifically, he did the first DBS case in France because what he did is he had this aha moment in the 80s. He was doing these procedures and it was the same time they were creating cardiac pacemakers. So he said, why can't we use the same technology in the brain? We know if we apply stimulation, we can stop that tremor. So he created deep brain stimulation by taking the same technology of a cardiac pacemaker and applying it to the brain, and voila, DBS was born. So the first case was done in France in 1987, came across the United States in the early, two, uh, early 1990s. Um, where I used to work at Barrow, where Dr. Ponce is, they were one of the original sites for the FDA trials to see if this was safe and effective before the FDA would approve it. So it was approved in 1997 for tremor, 2002 for Parkinson's, and 2003 for dystonia. So my point is this is not new. This is not experimental. This has been FDA approved in this country for 25 years. So the DBS system is kind of like modular furniture. It's made up of three distinct parts that hook together. And the beauty of that system is if one part needs to be replaced, you don't have to take everything out and start from scratch. So the first part of the system is the lead or electrode. It's what we put into the brain to apply that stimulation. There are tiny little wires. I normally pass these around because of COVID. We're not allowed to anymore. Small little wire like this. Like I said, you could have one or you could have two, depending on your disease and your symptoms. So it's implanted into the brain on an angle like this. About four inches goes down into the brain in an area called the basal ganglia. It's an area of the brain that houses all of those circuits for movement. So it goes like this, about four inches down into your brain, like this. I always carry my brain with me everywhere I go. Anyway, so here is what we call the tail of the lead. What do we do with this? This gets tucked under the skin of the scalp until we hook it with that connector that went down under the skin of the neck that I showed you on the video. So about four inches down on an angle into your brain. On the tip of this, you will see, just like this, these little metal bands. These are called contacts. So this is where we apply the stimulation. We could use one or more of these contacts. Now, depending on which lead is implanted, you may have four of these little contacts or you might have eight of these little contacts. It depends. So these are contacts. You're gonna hear that word a lot in your DBS journey. Once you have your, your DBS implanted, what contact are we gonna use? Is it contact two, contact three? Which one gives you the best relief of your symptoms? So this is the lead or electrode, and the contacts are the little metal bands that sit on the end, these tiny little metal bands. So they look like this. The next part of the system is the extension or connector. I'm, I apologize, I don't have one with me, but the reps are gonna show you. It's how we connect that wire, you know, the tail of the lead that's tucked under the skin of the scalp, we connect it right about here behind the ear with a little incision, connect it up with a very special instrument. We glide it down under the skin of the neck to the chest where it's connected with the battery in the chest. You may have one, you may have two. They're very thin, you can't really see them. Only if you extend your neck very tautly like that, you might see the outline of it, otherwise you don't see them. The third part of the system, and this is the brains of the operation, it's like a little mini computer we implant in your chest, 
is called many things. The neurostimulator, the internal pulse generator, or the battery. For simplicity's sake, here in Arizona, we refer to it as the battery. So this is what generates and controls the stimulation that we send to those little targets, those nuclei in your brain. We tell it, as the clinicians, we tell it how much to send and where to send it to and how frequently to send the stimulation. So this is the brains of the operation. And it's typically implanted if you take your fingers, two finger breaths below your clavicle, which is this bone here, and two finger breaths from your sternum, which is this bone here. So it sits around here in the chest, right about in here on the chest. So there's two types of batteries I want you to be available, uh, aware of, and I want you to ask the reps about them. Number one, we have something called a non-rechargeable battery. I call it the crock pot model, set it and forget it. We implant that battery, we program it, tell it how many, what electrical stimulation signals to send to your brain, and you forget about it. You go about your business for three to five years, battery starts to wear down much like your car battery, and there's a way for you to tell at home how much battery charge you have and when you need to come in and get that battery changed. It literally takes Dr. Ponce 12 minutes to change a battery, faster than your car, right? He opens up the incision on your chest, pops out the old battery, connects a new one, tests it, and puts it back in your chest and closes that same incision. That's how easy it is to do. It's an outpatient procedure, and you're in the hospital maybe for about three hours. That's it. They give you very light sedation just for comfort. So that's re the non-rechargeable battery. The other type of battery available to you is called a rechargeable battery. These batteries are very thin, very small, and they're that size because it doesn't have to hold a charge for many years. They last for 15 years. However, you have to charge up your battery on a regular basis, and it's so simple to do. Um, it's like you're charging your cell phone or you're charging your um, laptop. I mean, it's just something that you incorporate into your lifestyle. It's very easy. The reps will show you, but there's a sleeve you put around your neck with pockets. You take the, the uh, recharger, and you just put it in one of those pockets, depending on if it's on the left side or right side. Click go, make sure you're having a good connection, and you sit and read a book, have a cup of coffee, watch a TV program. Some patients do it every day and top it off. That, if that's your preference. Some patients do it once a week on a Saturday. They sit and put on a movie. So it's up to you how frequently, but you have to keep on top of it. We send you home with a little patient programmer so you can check your battery level every day, and you can see how often you have to charge it up. And it's so simple to do. So those are the two types available to you. Non-rechargeable, set it and forget it, lasts three to five years, or the rechargeable, which lasts 15 years, but you're responsible for charging it up. So we talk about the battery. Where do we put it? Like I said, about two finger breaths here, two finger breaths over from the sternum. This is a little misleading. This looks like it's right at the nipple line. It's not, it's, it, it should, the picture should show it right about up here. We typically do it on the non-dominant side of the chest, which is the left side because 85% of the population is right-handed. However, there are circumstances when we are going to put it on the right side of your body. For example, if you have a cardiac pacemaker already on the left side of your chest or an implanted defibrillator, we can put it on the left side. There's no question that these don't um, function well together. It's not a problem. They just have to be on different sides. If someone has had breast cancer or lung cancer on one side or the other, they're fine now. There's always a possibility of a recurrence, so we take that into mind, and we'll put on the opposite side in the event that patient has a recurrence and has to have some treatment. So it's actually your choice. The other thing you have to think about is your sports, your hobbies. If you shoot a gun, like many people in Arizona do, you know we want to put the battery on the same side as where your gun stock lies because of recoil. And I promise you, if you're a golfer, it doesn't affect your swing. Where, which side do we put it on? It doesn't affect your ability to fish. So it's in there, and it settles in nicely, and it's fairly comfortable. Also, um, I forgot to mention, we can put it in your belly if you want, right down here. We put an extra long connector that comes down 
over the chest, in the chest, and we can put it in your belly. Some people just don't want anything in their chest. Let's say you're a tiny little person, small, we call it small body habitus. Um, maybe you don't want to put it in your chest, or maybe you just don't want an incision here. There's many reasons, so we can put it in your belly, but I can tell you your um, post-op recovery is a little bit more uncomfortable than if we put it in the chest, because think about it. You have, if anybody's had any abdominal surgery, you sneeze, oh, that hurts. You get up from a chair, oh, it hurts. But it settles in nicely, but I'm telling you, if you do it in the belly, it's just going to be a little bit more uncomfortable for you after surgery until you heal. So there's three types of devices on the market. There's Medtronic, Abbott, Boston Scientific. They all function the same by delivering stimulation to those nuclei in your brain. However, they all have their own features and benefits. And again, the reps are going to talk to you in detail about what they offer. So Dr. Evidente will discuss with you what he feels would be the best product for you or the best device, but you also have your input. And that's why we have the reps here. So you can understand the differences in these systems. All right, let's talk about Parkinson's disease. You can't just show up in Dr. Evidente or Dr. Ponce's office, knock, knock, hello, I hear, I want that brain procedure. No, no, it doesn't work that way. So what we look at this, we look at patients that have had what's called idiopathic Parkinson's disease for four years or more, somebody whose medications still work, but maybe you're taking more pills, but they're still giving you benefit. And thirdly, um, we're looking at patients that may have one of the following symptoms, wearing off, motor fluctuations. You take your pill, you're, you're doing okay, and then it drops off, kind of like that. My dad had Parkinson's, and we called it Daddy's Roller Coaster Day. His pills still worked, but not as frequently and not as long, but they still gave him benefit, but it was like this. We look for patients who may or may, ha may, or may not have prominent tremor, and we look for patients who may or may not have dyskinesia. Do you know what that word is, dyskinesia? Anybody ever seen Michael J. Fox on TV, the Wigglies? It's from high doses of medication. So four years of diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, you're still responsive to your medications, and you have one or more of the following, motor fluctuations, tremor, or dyskinesias. So this is one of our patients that made this graph for us. This was his normal day. You can see he gets up in the morning, he takes all those pills on the bottom, he waits about an hour for this medicine to kick in, and then he's good for about an hour and a half, and then it suddenly drops off. And then he has facial dyskinesias and his tremor come out, comes out. So he takes more pills, has to wait till they kick in. He's good for about two hours there, boom, drops off again. These are called motor fluctuations. This is what happened to him after DBS. No more fluctuations, it was like, he was smooth with his meds working all day long. His dyskinesias went away, his tremor went away. So, and this is an actual patient did this graph for us. So any questions on who's a good candidate for Parkinson's disease? And what I mean by idiopathic Parkinson's disease, there's a lot of people that present with Parkinson-like symptoms. But what happens if, if it's not Parkinson's, it's a Parkinsonism, meaning, it could be multi-system atrophy or PSA or something different. DPS is not going to help those Parkinsonism diseases. So when you have one of those offshoot Parkinson-like diseases, they exacerbate quite quickly versus Parkinson's, which is a slowly progressing disease. And we know if you have this progression for four years or more, it is likely you have Parkinson's, not one of these other kind of diseases. So let's talk about patient selection for essential tremor. Essential tremor is actually the most common movement disorder there is. There's more people suffering from essential tremor than Parkinson's, but we don't really hear about it that much. So it's uh, more familial, meaning somebody, 50% or more of people have a family member that has tremor. The difference between Parkinson's tremor and essential tremor is this. A Parkinson's tremor is a rest tremor. I'm at rest right now. I'm not doing anything. I'm resting and my tremor's like this. Or I could be walking my tremor's like this. Essential tremor, I'm standing here and I'm doing nothing. I'm perfectly okay until I activate my muscle. And then I'm gonna start to tremor. I'm activating my muscle. That's the difference, rest tremor versus uh, action tremor. And people with essential tremor don't have the other types of 
symptoms that Parkinson's patient do, the, the slowness and the stiffness. They don't have that. So it's a whole different kind of disease, but it is very troublesome because there is no medication for tremor only. The drugs that are prescribed for tremor are what we call secondary medications. They're for something else. They just happen to dampen tremor a little bit. So it could be nerve pain, cardiac medicine, epilepsy medicine. Those are the medicines that are typically given to help dampen tremor. And they work for a while. Yes, they do. However, over time, they lose their effectiveness. And many times, patients have terrible side effects from these drugs. So when you've tried two or more medications and they don't work or they're giving you terrible side effects, and in your opinion, your tremor is affecting your quality of life, it's time to consider DBS. Let's talk a little bit about dystonia. Dystonia is involuntary muscle contractions. One example is something we call um, cervical dystonia or torticollis. If you've ever seen people walk around and their heads are kind of like this, that's cervical dystonia. They're have their muscles are just pulling and they can't control it. There's many different types of um, dystonia, but what we look for are patients that have what's called primary dystonia versus a dystonia that was brought on by perhaps um, oh, a drug use or an injury or something like that, primary dystonia. There's many types of dystonia. It can affect any part of your body, but more often we see it in the head, the face, the neck, things like that could be the arms. And also Parkinson's patients sometimes will suffer from a degree of dystonia. We call it dystonic movement. Many of our patients complain that their hands cramp up or their feet cramp up. That's a dystonic, we call it dystonic feature. But primary dystonia is something that we um, can do DBS for. And also, again, you've tried medications and there's not a whole lot of medications for people suffering from dystonia, maybe Botox, maybe baclofen, things like that. But they may work for a while, but then they start to lose their efficacy. And if the dystonia is now getting in the way, if you're having quality of life, it's time to consider this procedure. Let me tell you with dystonia though, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for your symptoms to be um, corrected with DBS versus a tremor. We can hit a tremor like this with stimulation, but sometimes with dystonia, it takes three to six months for you to really see 100% uh, improvement. So other patient considerations. You have to be in good general health to undergo this procedure because it's an elective procedure. It's not life, you know, it's not life or death procedure. So you have to be in good general health for an elective procedure. So if you're under the care of a medical specialist, like a cardiologist or rheumatologist, or anybody, we reach out to them ahead of time and get um, approval for you to have, undergo your surgery. We call it clearance. They also will give us instructions on, let's say you're on a blood thinner. We always go to your physician who prescribes it and say, we need to take this patient off the blood thinner at what, how many days before surgery, in your opinion, can we do that? So we go by their guidelines. We also look for patients that are available for follow-up care and programming visits because let's say you live in rural New Mexico and you have no means of transportation. We're going to think twice about putting a medical device in your body if you have no method of having it checked or having it programmed or, or um, updated. So we look for that. We also look for patients that have family or community support system because for the first several weeks after surgery, you're not allowed to drive after a brain procedure. So we look for patients that have a family or community support. And if you don't, we try to come up with a plan to do, help you with that. One question we even got more than once was people that live alone that have an animal. Who's gonna take care of my dog? Well, one of our neuropsychologists who works with Dr. Evidente, her name's Dr. Um, Dr. Robin, she um, did some research and found out the Humane Society has temporary fostering for people that are undergoing medical procedures or in the hospital so that somebody can look after their animal while they're not able to. So isn't that great that she went out? Dr. Garrett, Robin Garrett. So what can DBS improve? Tremor? slowness, stiffness, motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, those are my J. Fox wigglies, and dystonic movement, dystonia, dystonic movement.
patients may also see a reduction in medication. And I have to tell you, in my decade of experience in DBS, Dr. Evidente is one of the experts in how to manage stimulation and medication reduction. It's amazing what he's able to do. So I'm telling you, you're in very good hands. So less likely to improve, balance walking, freezing of gait, trouble with speech or uh, swallowing, and cognitive issues. However, if your, your gait walking is be affected by your, let's say, Parkinson's, and you're slow and you're stiff, and we correct those symptoms for you, and your gait's better, that gait will be better. If you have anxiety or cognition issues, because you have a central tremor and you're anxious when you go out because anxiety will make your tremor worse, and we correct your tremor symptoms, that kind of anxiety is lifted. But Balance, walking, freezing of gait, trouble with speech or swallowing, depression, anxiety, cognitive challenges are things we cannot promise you that DBS is going to help. However, if these symptoms seem to improve when you take your meds, you might have a benefit on going with DBS. So goals and expectations, think about what are your goals and expectations because you have some input into this. One side, two sides, what kind of device you want, where do you want your battery? So you have to think about this. Also with Parkinson's, there's two different areas of the brain that we can put those little wires in depending on your symptoms and your what your goals are. So you have to express that to Dr. Evidente and talk about that. And I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that. It's very important for you to share this with your doctors because these are decisions that you're making with your doctor. So who's the right patient? This is the evaluation process for DBS. A discussion with your physician, which you've all had because you're sitting here today. Some doctors will do an MRI of the brain early on just to make sure you have nothing else going on. I just talked to a group in Tennessee where they had a patient that was ready to go for DBS. They did an MRI, found out this person had an aneurysm that didn't look good. So can't do surgery just yet. So that's made mainly why they do baseline MRIs. Um, on-off testing, has any of you with Parkinson's had on-off testing yet? That's, remember when I talked about you still have to demonstrate that you're getting benefit from your medications? Well, Dr. Evidente will have you come in off your meds for about 12 hours and do a functional test. It's called UPDRS testing, where you tick, do this, do this, walk up and down, you know, they're going to check your joints, and they score it and you get that score off your meds. Then you sit in the office, you take your meds, wait till they kick in, and we test you again, and we compare the scores, and that will show us that you have benefit to your medication because we're looking at those functional scores. So that's one way of determining whether or not you're still getting benefit from your meds. Neuropsych evaluation. Has anybody here had a neuropsych test yet with Dr. Garrett? No? Neuropsychological testing is very important because we are doing a procedure in the brain, and we don't want to do anything harmful. We take this oath, do no harm, and we don't want to harm your brain. So what it basically is looking for is whether you test out that you're on, your, on the road to dementia, have dementia, or um, have underlying psychological issues like um, clinical depression or something like that. So in that case, we'll get that treated ahead of time. If you are on the road to dementia or have dementia, we're likely not going to offer the procedure. The other thing that you may test out and get the diagnosis of is mild cognitive impairment. And don't be alarmed by that. <clears throat> it goes hand in hand with Parkinson's sometimes, mild cognitive impairment. But also, those of us who don't have Parkinson's, we also could have a degree of mild cognitive impairment. It's the aging of the brain. When we age, our brains shrink. And when your brain shrinks a little bit inside, you don't have the capacity for memory or function that you used to have. So don't be alarmed if you get that diagnosis. Don't be alarmed at all, but I'm just warning you, you might see that. But um, Dr. Garrett does all the testing for Dr. Evidente, and she's wonderful, and she explains everything to you. So what they're looking for is the different domains in your brain have different functions. It's like a big storage locker, and in, all, in that locker, there's different closets. So we have a closet for short-term memory, long-term memory executive functioning, you know, making decisions, all, word finding, all these closets in there. And so she's going to test all the different domains in the brain to see 
where your strengths lie and if you have some deficits in anywhere. So everybody has to go through that. It's a four hour test and many people come out feeling <sighs> exhausted, but we have to do it. It's part of the process. And it, oh, by the way, when you set your appointment, don't set yourself up for failure. Just think of the time of day when you're, you know, up and alert and happy. You know, if you're the kind of person that eats your lunch and has to take a nap every day at one o'clock, you don't want to have neuropsych testing in the afternoon. So that's what I'm saying. Um, you're going to have a neurosurgery consultation with Dr. Ponce. He's downtown at Barrow Neurological Institute on the campus of St. Joseph's, and that's where his primary office is. So on-off testing for Parkinson's patients, neuropsych testing for everybody, consultation with the neurosurgeon. So after all these things are done, we have something called physician consensus, where Dr. Ponce, Dr. Garrett, and Dr. Evidente get together. We used to do it in the office, and now we have to do it via Zoom, um, and discuss every patient. And everybody has to, it's a three-legged stool. Neuro, neurosurgery, neurology, and neuropsych have to all be in agreement that you're a good patient undergo this therapy. So they discuss every patient in detail and go over what device you've wanted, are we doing one side or two sides, where are we putting that battery? So everything is very thorough, there's no questions. And I really appreciate that because there's other programs where there's very little communication between the specialists, but this program, everybody is in consensus. So let's talk about targeting. I said with Parkinson's patients, there's two areas of the brain where we could drop those leads. One is called the subthalamic nucleus or the STN, the other one is the globus pallidus interna, the GPI. They both will help with overall Parkinson's symptoms, but again, you have a discussion with Dr. Evidente about what you think would be best. For example, if you want to come off all your meds or really decrease your meds, we might choose the STN. If you are a tremorous Parkinson's patient, he may choose the STN. Sometimes for patients that have mild cognitive impairment but multiple domains, he might choose the GPI. I have to tell you though, if we do the STN and we do bilateral, meaning both sides of the brain, and for some reason we have to crank up your stimulation really high to make your symptoms go away, you could have a little bit of a speech problem. I have to tell you that. But don't be alarmed because with all the new devices we have on the market now, we have tools in our toolboxes to avoid that, but I'm obligated to tell you there is a small chance that you could have what's called dysarthria. So listen to my voice. It's a sunny day in Sun City. I had bilateral, both sides, STN, and they cranked up my stimulation because I need it for my symptoms. My voice might sound like this. It's a sunny day in Sun City. Do you hear it's soft and a little slurry? So you may have that. However, we have all these new devices now that we use that can avoid that but I'm obligated to tell you. GPI, I have to tell you the programming takes a little longer and I'm gonna show you a picture. The GPI is a much bigger structure in the brain than the STN, so it takes a little bit more time for the stimulation effects to marinate in the brain tissue. So let's talk about essential tremor and dystonia. Well, essential tremor, you have no choice. We use the thalamus the ventral intermedius of the thalamus, or V-I-M. The thalamus is a very big structure, and we pinpoint this one area in there for tremor control. That's what we use for um, essential tremor. It also, it, again, both sides, crank it up high. It may affect your speech a little bit or your balance, but we have all these tools available now, but I still have to tell you this. Dystonia, we only use the GPI, and with dystonia, we typically do both sides of the brain to get the best result for your symptoms. So this is a picture of those areas in the brain. You can see I talked about the basal ganglia down here. The thalamus is that big pink area there. That's where, what we use for essential tremor. Sitting to the left, that green area, that's the GPI. And now that little white nubbin is the STN. It's smaller than my pinky nail. So you can see the difference in the sizes of the areas of the brain. So the question we always discuss with the patient and consensus is are we're going to do one side of the brain or two sides of the brain? I'll tell you, I want to say about 98 to 99% of patients that Dr. Ponce implants and Dr. Evidente sends to him have both sides done. The reason is 
your diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, usually come and affect one side of the body more than the other. But eventually, you're going to have symptoms on both sides over time. So why do two surgeries, right? We can put both leads in the same time, and many times we don't have to turn one side on until we have to. So I'm telling you, most of the patients have both sides done. There are times when they're only going to do one side, but the majority of our patients have both sides done at the same time. So we also look at surgical tolerance. That's very important. If you're a patient that's on Coumadin, for example, for um, a problem, it's a blood thinner. Every time you have a surgical procedure, you have to come off your blood thinner. And every time you come off your blood thinner, you're at risk for a stroke. So with that being said, it's more prudent to put both sides in at the same time to avoid an additional surgery. Because again, we don't have to turn both sides on. So the DBS devices, this is in your packet. I just put this together so you could have a quick and, and easy look at the different companies and the different features that they have available to you. For example, everybody, uh, every device now is MRI compatible. And some have voltage, some have constant current. That's the method of the stimulation delivery. So the reps are gonna go over with this you in detail. I just wanted you to have this little comparison in your packet. So. You've jumped through all the hoops. You've had all your testing. We've talked about you in consensus. We're a go. What happens next? Dr. Ponce typically does most of his surgeries downtown at St. Joe's. However, if you are familiar with the Honor Health system, healthcare system here in Scottsdale, and you're more comfortable having your surgery there, he actually will do the surgery at Honor Health Osborne campus, if that is your preference. So before surgery, we're gonna get a, what's called a planning MRI of your brain. It helps Dr. Ponce plan the trajectory of how he's going to put those leads in your brain safely and hit the target. You're gonna get an EKG chest X-ray labs, have an internal medicine consult. This all happens at the pre-op center. So we coordinate and we schedule everything for you. You come down a couple days before surgery to the pre-op center at the hospital and they'll take care of all of this for you on the same day. Um, we already will have pre-op clearance from your specialist, and you will be sent a packet in the mail or emailed, if that's your preference, of all your instructions. What time you're through surgery? What time to come to the hospital? What time is your pre-op testing? Where to go? Everything is spelled out and given to you in advance. And also, when you come into the pre-op center, they're going to send you home with a parting gift. It's a little, little bag, and it has in there a, something to scrub with and some antibacterial soap. And they're gonna tell you the night before surgery, chin to toes. You don't have to do your head because they're gonna do that in the operating room. So this is a picture of a pre-op MRI. It's a very specific MRI of the brain that Dr. Ponce orders so he can see the anatomy of your brain and plan your trajectory. It's all done on this, what we call the planning station or stealth station. And it's mathematics. We have X, Y, Z coordinates. X is up and down, Y is this way, and Z is this way. So it's all done mathematically. And you can see here that he puts your scan up here and he does it on the computer. How is he gonna put that in? What are the coordinates? How many millimeters deep? There's no map for DBS. It's based on your anatomy. Everything is done um, based on your brain. So you can see here, you want to avoid the major blood vessels and you want to avoid the ventricles in the brain where the cerebrospinal fluid is. I want you to note though, you see they're not symmetrical. Our brains are not symmetrical, so each side is going to be a little bit different. So the day of surgery, like I said, you're going to get detailed instructions sent to you. Nothing to eat or drink after midnight. For Parkinson's patients, we always advise you to bring your medications in the original bottle with you to the hospital because Dr. Ponce writes a note. Uh, an order, excuse me, that says patient may take meds from home because sometimes the hospital formulary doesn't have all the medication. For example, they do not stock Ritari. And if you're on that drug, we don't want to mess up your drug regimen. So bring your medication with you and they will say, okay, you can take your meds. Um, know where you need to go and when you need to be there. Please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call either Dr. Ponce's office or Dr. Evidente's office. So DBS surgery, there's two methods of doing the surgery. Patients can be asleep under general anesthesia or patients can be awake with light sedation. Dr. Ponce only does the asleep procedure.
just so you know. And he'll go into detail how he does that in the uh, office. So DBS surgery, I'm not sure if you're aware, is done in two parts, two separate surgeries. The first surgery is the lead placement when the wires are placed in the brain. That's what we call an inpatient procedure, and patients spend one or two nights in the hospital and go home. Then you come back 10 to 14 days later to have the battery placed and connected. Can anybody guess why it has to be done that way? Reimbursement. Medicare has deemed this is an inpatient procedure and this is an outpatient procedure, and you can't um, get reimbursed for both on the same day. And every commercial plan follows Medicare guidelines, so that's why it's done for reimbursement purposes. Uh, it's really unfortunate. So the battery placement, 10 to 14 days later, as an outpatient, they will give you some light sedation because you're going home that day, and he will make a little incision here and put the wires in and connect the wires in the brain to the battery in the chest. So inpatient procedure, outpatient procedure. So let's talk about the surgery. You're going to come into the operating room. First in the pre-op center, they're going to start an IV. They're going to give you a little something-something to put you in your happy place while they bring you in and get you all nestled up on the table. And once you're pretty much relaxed, they're going to intubate you for the uh, asleep. They're going to give general anesthesia. Once that is done, they're going to scrub up your head on the left. You'll see that. That's actually an old picture of a awake, uh, awake patient. They're going to scrub up your head, put the frame on your head. I know it looks very archaic, but you're asleep and you're not going to feel anything. They're going to take a CAT scan right in the operating room of your head with that frame on your head. Because what Dr. Ponce does to really hone in on those XYZ coordinates, he takes that CT with the box, the frame, merges it with that MRI. Now he has a 3D picture of your brain, and if he wants to make any little changes to direct trajectory before he starts, he's able to do so. So once that's done, it's go time. So they're going to clip a little bit of hair where the incisions on the scalp are going to be made. Just right behind the hairline, just clip a little hair. He doesn't believe in shaving the head. This goes on the frame. This is called the arc. And you can see there's numbers on there, and they correspond with those XYZ coordinates. So we know exactly the angle and the depth of how to get that lead in the brain based on your anatomy. So he's going to clip the hair, make a little semicircular incision on the scalp, flap it back, and then do what's called a burr hole. It's a little drill hole through the skull. Now the skull is, I saw that, you're asleep. You're asleep. Um, this is bone, and we have to get through the bone to put the wire in. So they make a little burr hole with a drill uh, about the size of a dime. Once that's done, they're going to put that lead in here, put it down into your brain, and then we'll do the other side. Semicircular incision, flap it back, make the burr hole, put the lead in, and before they close, we're going to get one more CAT scan overlay that over the original plan and you can see without a shadow of a doubt exactly where those leads are placed. Now the goal in DBS is to be within two millimeters of your plan target. It's kind of like a dartboard. You know, there's that hole in the middle and if you hit anywhere in that black hole you're going to get 10 points. Same with DBS. Two millimeters. You want that lead to be within that two millimeters of your plan target. Dr. Ponce is pretty good. His average is I think about 0.6 millimeters to target. So that's pretty, pretty accurate. So then once they've confirmed the leads are exactly where they want them to be, you're going to put a little antibiotic powder in here, put a cap in there that's going to hold that lead in place. The lead is going to come up, like I said, four inches down. The tail is going to be tucked under the skin of your scalp. And then he's going to flap back the skin, and he closes with staples. So you're going to go home with two smiley spaces of here of staples. That's my lame picture. So I want to show you why we make semicircular incisions. Because there's a little plastic cap that's there in the burr hole that holds that lead in place. We never want to make an incision over an object. You go around the object to avoid that incision opening up. So that's why we do the smiley faces. So let's review. Pre-planned target and trajectory are loaded onto the planning station, stealth station and it's, it, it comes up to the operating room. The frame is placed, the CT is done, 
coordinates are set on the arc, the scalp is cleansed, the hair is clipped, incisions are made, burr holes are done, the leads are placed, we do another CT to verify placement, the burr hole and the leads are capped, the skin is flat back, and we close with staples. And that's, it's pretty straightforward. That's a picture of that CT that's merged with the MRI. Do you see the detail in there? It's amazing, the neuroimaging we have available to us today. This allows Dr. Ponce to perform the procedure with perfection and accuracy. This is a picture of the interoperative CT we use. It's called an O-arm. It's a great piece of equipment. And back in the day when you were in a trauma center, which St. Joe's is, um, and somebody was having difficulty, you would have to take that patient and bagging them down to the CT. Now we can do it right in the operating room. And this little piece of equipment, well, it's not that little, has saved multiple lives because you have that equipment right there in the operating room. So this is a picture of a cap. It's a little plastic cap. What happens is that lead is going to come up from the brain through the center of the cap, and it sits in this trough here. And then the top of this is put on, and it's held in place with two little screws that screwed into the bone. So the second procedure is done about 10 to 14 days later. You, it's an outpatient procedure. You are going to come to the hospital, get a little bit of sedation. He's going to make an incision behind the ear on the side where we're going to put the battery, free up the tails of the leads, connect them to the connectors, and with a special instrument, glide it down under the skin of the neck to the chest, make a small incision on the chest, connect the connectors to the battery, and then put the battery under the skin. The muscle is not, not, the muscle is not cut and he tacks it in place. And then it settles in nicely and it heals. And you get a little scar tissue pocket over it that's gonna heal it in place. You're in the hospital for a couple hours that day, but you will go home. So what you can expect post-operatively, after the leads are placed in your brain, and I said you're gonna spend one to two nights in the hospital, you could have a honeymoon. So that means, oh my gosh, look, my symptoms are better. How's that? I don't even have the battery yet. What happens is when they put the leads in the brain, the brain cells, the brain tissue swells up. And when those little brain cells swell up, they give off a little electrical charges and it mimics the effects of DBS. So you might have experience that your symptoms are better. As the swelling goes down, your symptoms are gonna come back to where they were before until we put the battery in. So please keep taking your medication. You're gonna have a headache, right? You had brain surgery. However, the top of your head is gonna feel numb for several weeks. When they cut through the skin of the scalp, it cuts through the nerve endings. That will regenerate. You might feel a little tingly or a little itchy. That's the nerves coming back. But this is gonna be numb. Most patients complain of pain here and here. And it's from the pressure of that frame being on your head. So we're gonna give you, we're gonna give you some narcotics. And um, three days after surgery, you can start taking ibuprofen, things like that. I have to tell you, most patients are off any narcotics by the third day because it's not a painful recovery, it's an uncomfortable recovery. You might have some cognitive changes right after surgery, again, from that swelling in your brain. You could have some confusion, word finding difficulties, slurred speech, short-term memory, new learning, that kind of thing. It's temporary, it's absolutely temporary. When patients experience that, they're usually back to normal by the time they come in for the battery. You might have worsening of balance or walking right after surgery, because anytime you do surgery on the brain, it could throw off your equilibrium. So just be aware of that when you go home. You could have a little swelling around your eyes, because in the OR, you're flat. And you might have some tissue fluid build up in your eye sockets. It's not, to be, it's not to be worried about. The only time we worry is when you report that your vision has changed. That's when we worry. But if you have some swelling or even some bruising, looks like somebody whacked you, not to worry. Just use ice. So what you may experience after the battery's put in your chest, you can have a little neck stiffness. You know, they put those connectors in there. It could be a little stiff. When you're in the office, uh, Maggie's going to give you some neck stretching exercises, just basic stretching so you don't develop scar tissue down the connectors. Tenderness at the site of the connector incision right here. This is what patients complain about more than anything else. This little incision here where they connect the connectors to the the wires in the brain. So if you sleep on your right side and that's where your incision is, this is my advice to you. Get yourself one of those travel neck pillows, you know? Sleep on that because you're not putting any pressure on there. It's kind of right there in the middle of that. So there's no pressure on there. So that's something to do. Um, 
the tenderness will subside it will go away it will get better but right after surgery that's the most frequent place that somebody complains of pain bruising at the chest side you could have a little bruising here it could be uncomfortable ladies i highly suggest that you get yourself a good cotton sports bra breast tissue is heavy so if you have the battery in your chest and you're not wearing a bra, it's going to pull it down and it's going to feel a little tight. So get a nice sports bra because you don't want a bra strap rubbing there for the incisionist. Get a nice cotton sports bra that has, you know, it's large like this and you'll be comfortable. And a lot of people like to sleep in an upright chair the first night as well. So that's up to you. Um, ice is your friend. Please use clean ice packs on any of those incisions. Remember, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. So post-op care, like I said, most patients spend one to two nights in the hospital and go home. Pain, you're going to have pain meds ordered for you. They're going to verify your pharmacy when you're in the hospital because everything has to be electronic now with narcotics. And ice is your friend, clean ice packs. You can shower three days after surgery. No driving for a couple of weeks. Dr. Ponce or Dr. Evidente will clear you to drive. Uh, use common sense. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to fall. You're like, don't go up a step stool at home, watch your throw rugs, watch your small animals you might have in your home that you could trip. And please don't walk your 100 pound dog and like they see the bunny and they're gonna pull you down and hit your head, that's happened. So just be mindful of that, just common sense. And no push, pull or lift, anything greater than 10 pounds for about four weeks after the battery's placed, you just don't wanna put undue stress on that incision. Oh, and swimming, we ask you not to go in a pool, submerging or a hot tub submerging for about six weeks. This takes six weeks for your skin to completely close up. Also, ladies, no hair dye for six weeks because it's chemicals. You don't want to put chemicals on a healing incision. So get your hair done right before surgery. And it's okay to have gel nails or dips. They're not going to have you take your nail polish off for surgery. So don't worry about that. So reasons might, why patients might re stay an additional night in the hospital. I talked about one to two nights. Uh, we looked at all the stats that Dr. Ponce keeps. And the number one reason why his patients spent more than one night in the hospital following DBS surgery was urinary retention, believe it or not, after brain surgery. So what happens is this. As we age, we don't metabolize medications like narcotics or anesthesia like we did when we were 25. As we age, both men and women might have some difficulty voiding. So those two things coupled with anesthesia, boom, you might not be able to empty your bladder. We're going to keep you until you can. Nausea, vomiting, that's another common reason why people might stay one extra day in the hospital. If you're one of those people like me that doesn't do well with anesthesia, and I've been a surgical nurse for my whole career, and I don't tolerate anesthesia, please tell the anesthesiologist because they can give you some medication before you wake up that's going to help you. Confusion, like I described, if you have those cognitive difficulties right after surgery, we're going to hold you a day or so just to make sure you're starting to clear. It's not safe to somebody, somebody home like that. Pain is the number four reason. Even though I told you this is not a painful procedure, it's an uncomfortable procedure, everybody's pain level is different. So if your pain isn't being managed to your benefit, you have to tell them and they're going to keep you until you're more comfortable to go home. And age is the number five reason. Statistically, if you're over the age of 70, you're more likely to experience one through four. That's just statistics. But it doesn't mean because you're 70 or 71 that you're going to have to spend two nights in the hospital. So these are post-up incisions. You can see the upper left. That's a head incision with a smiley face upside down. You can see very minimal hair is uh, clipped. To the right of that is a chest incision. I put that picture up there so you can see there is a little bit of bruising. And it is a little pink looking there, right? We want to take those staples out between 10 and 14 days after they're placed. That's the sweet spot. You don't want to keep them in too long, and you don't want to take them out too soon. So that's the body screaming, get these out of me. It's time. And you can see this is 30 days out. You can't even see his incisions on his scalp. So surgical risks, Dr. Ponce will go over the, with you in detail down at the office, but infection is the number one um, post-op complication they want to consider for any surgery. Dr. Ponce's rate, I believe, is the lowest in the nation for post-op infection. Um, lead repositioning in the brain, 
every now and then, you know, as best as we can, everything looks perfect, but that patient might not be getting the best benefits, and they may have to take you back to the OR just to tweak that lead a little bit, but that's rare. Hardware failure in the neck, don't forget, this is very tiny little delicate wires. Um, if there's a kink anywhere, it can be replaced. Seizures, we had, oh gosh, out of about 1,200 patients, I think there were maybe a dozen or more that had post-op seizures. These were one-time isolated incidences with no recurrence. Nobody knew why they happened. They happened, and even though it's, it's minimal, we have to tell you it could happen to you. What we think happens is when the brain cells swell up and give those little electrical charges, they mimic, they, they make the seizure happen. But it's very rare, but we have to tell you it could happen. Stroke-like symptoms, we've had patients wake up where half their body is flaccid. It's like, uh-oh, stroke. Get a CT, it's not a stroke. What we see is the wire in the brain, they're swelling along the tract. And when you have that swelling, it pushes up on the area of the brain called the motor strip. So if they push up on this side, that side of the brain is going, that side of the body is going to be flaccid. So you just wait till the swelling goes down. They uh, had no more symptoms. However, it's scary to wake up like that. We have to tell you it could happen. It's rare, but it could. Bleeds. Bleeds can happen. It's a surgical procedure, but the statistics are very low. So half of the bleeds that we see are on a post-op CAT scan because he does one when you leave the recovery room before you go to the floor just to make sure everything's okay. They're asymptomatic bleeds. What happens is you put the wire in, you get almost like a brain bruise. You know when you hit your hand and it turns purple? That can happen here. So we see that on a scan, but there's no symptoms. Sometimes patients have minor little bleeds that cause some kind of neurological problems that patient is gonna come back into the, the uh, emergency room and be admitted, watch them. We've had no massive bleeds, no deaths, um, ischemic stroke, uh, ischemic stroke is a dry stroke. You know, there's a wet stroke and a dry stroke. A wet stroke is hemorrhagic, meaning a massive bleed. A dry stroke is when you don't get enough blood flow to areas of the brain and the brain tissue starts to die a little bit and you'll get stroke-like symptoms. We've had two patients out of 1,200 that have experienced that. We don't know why. Both gentlemen had to go to neuro rehab and both recovered fully. Possible stimulation-related side effects. <coughs> Excuse me. Once Dr. Evidente starts to program your device, you might have some weight gain. Hey, I'm just a messenger. Um, the reason is, let's say you're a tremorous patient. You have a lot of tremor. When you're moving like this, you're burning calories. So we take that away, and you eat the same amount of ice cream, you might have a little weight gain. So just be aware of that. Mood changes. Deep down in the brain, where those nuclei are for movement, are the same nuclei for mood. So if the stimulation leaches out a little bit and your mood changes, you have to tell Dr. Evidente. Um, what we see, not frequently, but if you're going to see it, we see pseudobulbar effect, where you cry for no reason. You're watching a comedy on TV and you start to cry. So if that happens, just tell him it might be a little stimulation leaching out. And I talked about speech changes, but with the new technology we have, we can avoid that. You're going to go home with the patient programmer when we put the battery in your chest. It's like this, very small, and that's yours to keep. And when you're at home, you can do a lot of things with it. You can turn your battery on and off. You can check your battery life to see if you need to charge it. You can check your battery if you have a non-rechargeable to see, oh my, it's getting low. I might have to call the doctor to get it changed. So there's a variety of things you can do, and the reps are gonna go over that with you. But just, I wanted to show you that you're gonna get one of these patient programmers. And then about, oh, after your battery's placed, Maybe within the first week after the battery's placed in your chest, Dr. Evidente is going to schedule some appointments for you to come in, and they will program your battery. Now, initially, they're going to check all those contacts, those little metal bands, to see which one or ones give you the best benefit and reduction of symptoms without side effects. So it takes a little bit of maybe an hour and a half that first visit, but then afterwards it's just tweaking it a little bit. So medical treatments and tests following DBS surgery. You can never have diathermy. Diathermy is deep heat. It's typically reserved for professional athletes, but some chiropractic offices still offer it today. What happens is it heats up the muscles and the organs in your body, and if they, it's too close to your chest, it could heat up the IPG, the battery, 
the wires and that heat can go to your brain and it's very detrimental so please don't have diathermy. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a procedure that's done for profound depression when you sit inside an MRI scanner and they give pulsations of magnetic fields to help with your depression. Well, if you had profound clinical depression, we're not going to do surgery on you. So the likelihood of you being offered that therapy is very minimal, but just so you're aware. Safeguards are needed for electrocautery, that zap in the bleeders in the operating room. So we always tell you if you're having any kind of a procedure, turn your device off. You can do that easily with your patient programmer. You put it up on the chest, make a connection, boom, turn it off. Then after the procedure, you turn it right back on. Lithotripsy, banging those kidney stones. A safeguard would be instead of having the ultrasound or the laser going up like this that could go towards your battery, you'll point it in a different direction. So my point here is whenever you're having any kind of procedure, you need to let that person know that you have a DBS in place. Therapeutic ultrasound, a lot of PTs do that. Uh, it's perfectly safe. We just ask them to stay at least four inches away from the battery. And MRIs, all three of our devices on the market are MRI compatible. Um, many times we have to, the doctors, Dr. Abdente or Dr. Ponce, have to fill out what's called an MRI eligibility form to send in with your MRI order saying, yes, this patient has a, has a device that's MRI safe. And um, there are some freestanding radiology centers that don't have the safety protocols in place. So if you need an MRI ongoing after surgery, Call Dr. Ponce's office, call Dr. Evidente's office to find out which centers close to you have those in place. Or you can always call your device manufacturer's rep and they can guide you as well. You don't want to show up the day of an MRI and have walk in and all of a sudden they go, oh, we can't do the MRI on you. You have a device. So just call. So treatments that are safe, CAT scans, x-rays, PET scans, fluoroscopy, and mammography, all safe. Airport security, that's the number one question we get asked following the surgery. Tell the TSA you have a pacemaker, which you do, you're not lying to the government, it's a brain pacemaker. They will either do a pat down for you or put you through the body scanner, which is x-ray. Do not go through the security scanner because they're looking for guns and weapons and things. You're going to set it off. And what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to wand you. You don't want to be wanded. It's rare, but if they hold that wand against your chest for a prolonged period of time, there is a possibility that you could feel it jolt and the battery shuts down. But you can turn it back on, but you don't want to experience that. So just tell me I have a pacemaker. Every airport in the world has a protocol. See, that's safe. Do not do that because they're going to want to wand you, the standard one. I was just in a courthouse recently, and I went through this. Well, I set it off, apparently. And the guard came over to me. He said, do you have any devices in your body? I thought, no. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I just had a knee replacement. Yeah, I do. I set it off there, but when I went to the airport, I didn't. Isn't that weird? So frequently asked questions, dental work. There's no reason that you need to be covered with antibiotics or anything. The only thing with dental work is you never want to have one of those ultrasonic scrapers left on your chest near your battery, and any good dental hygienist is not going to do that. EKGs. Because you have electricity floating around your body, it may make what we call a cloudy strip. So they may ask you to turn your device off, do the EKG, turn it right back on. Just be aware of that. And surgical procedures, again, always turn it off. Always, always, always. So other frequently asked questions. If you need emergency resuscitation, have at it. You're walking in the mall. The person with DBS goes, clutches their chest and goes down. You want to get the paddles, the defibrillator in the mall. You want to start CPR, do it. If they break something, so what? They saved your life. We can fix it. So never hesitate about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And also personality changes. Um, if, like I said, your mood changes, something's not quite right, you're melancholy, just tell Dr. Evidente. It could be from the stimulation, but it also could be from wearing down on your medications. You know, when you're with Parkinson's and you're on levodopa, levodopa gives you a little jolt, a little high. So if you're coming off those meds, you might get a little melancholy. Just let your doctor know, let Dr. Evidente know. 
And so I want you to think about, is DBS right for you? Think about the potential risks versus the benefits. Have realistic expectations, meaning that once you have surgery, you're not going to run the Boston Marathon if you haven't done it last year. And have open discussions with your friends and your family because they're going to be involved um, in this process with you and have no questions left unanswered. So please, please don't ever hesitate to call the offices because we're there for you. And if you have any questions, even if it, you forgot that, oh, should I dye my hair? or Oh, what about my nail polish? Or what should I do about this? Don't hesitate to call. So the keys to successful surgery are threefold. Appropriate patient selection. That's Dr. Evidente's job. Uh, placing the, um, oh, this thing is very sensitive. I apologize. Accuracy of targeting and surgical expertise, that is Dr. Ponce's job. And then patient programming and medication management, that is Dr. Evidente's job. And you really want somebody with lots of experience and you're in good hands with Dr. Evidente. So remember, DBS is an additional therapy to help with certain movement disorders. It is safe, effective, and reversible. It is an elective surgery designed to match your specific symptoms, and it is not a surgery of last resort. Questions? Yes, sir. You said when you're going to have an EKG, you turn it off your... Mm -hmm. off. That patient program I showed you that you're going to get, you just make a connection, you put it up there, make a connection, press the off button. That's all you do. It's so easy. And then after they run the strip, you turn it right back on. Same with the surgery procedure. You turn it off. When you're in your recovery room, waking up, your wife, your friend, your husband comes in, they'll turn your battery back on. So thank you. Here's Dr. Ponce, that mask down there. <laughs> so can you talk more about the to Okay. What happens is the extension, the connector, it comes down like this across your chest and under the skin to the belly. It's not no, it is not. No, it doesn't matter because it's under the skin. They don't go deep. They don't cut any muscle down. Go near it. When visualize what you're explaining, putting that lead under your skin. Mm -hmm. I think it a lead is something like a it's a connector. Yes, it's a connector. It's plastic, pliable, stretchy. I've even done it. No, it's not with such force because we have a lot of play under the skin. Believe it or not, I even done it. I did it in a training class. I can do that surgery. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I can't. But as part of learning, we had to do it. So I'm telling you, we have a special instrument and it's curved. And we go like this. And I can't even describe it to you, but it just... It flows down so easily under the skin because you're not going through muscle. The wire is connected to it. There's a little clamp, and you pull the wire through with this. Okay. Dr. Ponce, I'll show you, but I'm telling you, if I can do it, it's very, and it's under the skin. No muscle is cut. You don't, you don't do that. It just glides under there. It's really, really cool. It's easier than you think. Yes, ma'am. My husband had four, two open surgery mm -hmm. for bypass. Yes. So, did the procedure What would happen is Dr. Ponce would reach out to his cardiologist and say, we're planning on doing this surgery on your patient. Will you clear him for surgery? I'll give you an example. My dad had Parkinson's. And I was the nurse in the busiest implanting center in the United States for DBS. And my father could not have surgery because his heart only functioned at 20%. So he was what we call a surgical risk. Not every patient is as bad as he was. So it depends on his cardiologist whether he will clear him or not. And Dr. Ponce will reach out and talk to that individual. All right. I think we're going to take a break now, folks. So thank you. I hope this was helpful. I know it's fast.